So I'm gonna start talking a little bit about the history of skull base surgery. And um, as is all known, this famous saying by George Santayana, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So it is important to take a quick look back before we look at where we are now and try to figure out where we're going. Uh, another great quote, telling the future by looking at the past assumes that conditions remain constant. This is like driving a car by looking in the rear view mirror. So things are always changing and our field of neurosurgery is constantly changing. And I think this talk will give a bit of an, an overview um, showing how it's changed. We like to think that we're fairly far along in our evolution, although we're probably back here, at least I hope we're back here. And I think we have a long way to go, but uh, the good news is we're probably not at the beginning of our evolution. So I'm gonna to talk today about skull-based surgery. So what is skull-based surgery? It's traditionally been one of the most difficult areas to access surgically. The skull base is surrounded by several critically important nerves and artery. And in order to get there through a craniotomy requires significant retraction of the brain or incisions in the face. And it's, it has in the past been very highly morbid. So this is obviously the, the cortex, uh, the skull top, as we would say, or the, this is you know, the, the top of the cranium. When you remove the brain, you get to the skull base. And as you can imagine, it's a hard place to get to because it's protected by the brain and, and by all the facial structures. So that's the skull base. When we look at it in the sagittal plane, it's this area here that is the skull base. Now, traditionally, and this is how I was taught, we would get there by doing a craniotomy and a craniotomy involves moving the brain out of the way. Um, and you can get retraction injury to the brain when you do that. So about you know, 30, 40 years ago, people collaborated with uh, ENT surgeons and head and neck surgeons to develop these complex approaches to try to remove a lot of bone to get to the skull base rather than retracting the brain. And, and these are just some examples of some of the approaches that try to get us to the skull base. But what you see is that they're better at exposing the nerves and the arteries than the actual skull base. And often the pathology lines lies behind those structures. Um, so these approaches, while great, often cause a lot of um, morbidity. Uh, big incisions are required often in the face. Uh, there's you know, a lot of uh, removal of uh, bone uh, to try to avoid brain retraction, but nevertheless, you still have to retract the brain significantly. This shows frontal lobe retraction. Uh, these openings often require complex cosmetic uh, closures to prevent CSF leak uh, and are pretty disfiguring and, and morbid. Um, this is a maxillary uh, Lafort osteotomy that's done uh, to go in through the uh, uh, mouth in order to get uh, to a place where we can get to very easy, easily with what I'll show you, which is an, an endoscopic skull base approach. Uh, and because a microscope was used for illumination in these surgeries, a lot of retractors were also used to create an opening. This is an opening in the mouth uh, to try to get where we need to get. So there was an approach that's similar to what we do now, but it had limited exposure. And that was what we call the transphenoidal approach and involved a sublabial incision below the lip. And then you'd put a retractor in on either side of the nasal septum. But because you were using a microscope, you really couldn't see that much. And you had a long septum called a hardy retractor that, that limited your, your field of view. Uh, now the idea was to replace this craniotomy that requires brain retraction to get to the skull base from above and try to basically flip everything over because the nerves and the arteries get in your way. And by using this transphenoidal approach, but modifying it so that we only use your nostrils to get in, we could open up the sinuses, which are mostly air filled and expose the entire base of the skull. And then by drilling out some bone, we could basically approach these tumors from the underside in which case you get to the tumor first and you get to the arteries and the uh, nerves afterwards. So that just shows you the tumor being removed. So the history of the transphenoidal approach dates back to you know, the 1800, 1900s where surgeons would first go in through the glabella, which is the bottom of the forehead, make an incision there uh, to try to get in through the nose. Um, this guy named Herbert Schlaffer in uh, early 1900s uh, developed another approach where he would literally flip the entire nose off to the side 
in order to get where he wanted to get. But the transfernal approach that I showed you with the speculum was developed first by Coker, Hirsch, and then Cushing, Hardy, and Gio. Cushing actually used it and then abandoned it um, in order to try to um, minimize the, the uh, damage to the brain in the face. But the key was the introduction of this, which is an endoscope. The advantage of the endoscope is it has its uh, illumination and also its lenses at the very end of the tip. Uh, and by advancing the tip in, you could see much better. So the microscope on the left has its lens and light source uh, at the back of the narrow tube, which would be the Hardy retractor. So you only see a little bit of Mr. Tumor's head, but if you put an endoscope through the nose, you then get your lens and your light source at the tip and you can look around and you can see much better. So this is the concept using an endoscope to go through the sinuses to get to the skull base. And this is what it looks like when we do our surgeries and you can see how minimally disruptive this is compared to the approaches that have been used in the past. And this is the view of the entire skull base with an endoscope. You can really see everything and you can see it uh, from a completely different angle. So um, the endoscope also has a bit of a history that I can talk about. And it starts out with just the speculum, which uh, you know we know well and is still used to get into some orifices and cavities today. This is just an ancient Roman speculum, but this guy named uh, Bozzini invented something called a Licht lighter or a light conductor in 1804, where he would advance a light into a cavity. It was basically a candle with a mirror and a funnel shaped tube. It was never really used clinically. Um, this is just a, an example of what that looked like. Um, and then, uh, this, this device uh, was developed again over time. Um, I don't have the, actually uh, the name you can't see here, sorry. Um, but endoscopes developed uh, over the years. This guy, Maximilian Nietzsche, uh, placed a platinum lit tip inside a cavity. Uh, and he wrote the quote, in order to light up the room, one was supposed to carry the lamp inside. So the idea of bringing a light into a cavity was developed by him. Victoria de Lespinas is a urologist who did the first neuroendoscopic procedure going into the choroid plexus um, using probably a urology scope. The lenses and the, the, the scopes we use today were invented by this guy, Harold Hopkins in 1966, which is that rod lens system. Um, and by having a rod and uh, going a long way uh, in a straight system with lenses, the resolution is very, very high. And as you can see also at the tip, the light goes out to the sides, giving you a much larger radius of view. Um, and then camera resolution also developed. Um, and obviously using CCD cameras, we now can put those cameras at the other end um, and project those onto, initially we had standard definition, then we had high definition, and now we have 4K cameras and 4K screens that increase our um, resolution. Um, fiber optics are also used a bit and we do have flexible scopes that we use and these can have a chip on the tip. You can put your, your CCD chip on the tip and LED light, but we tend not to use the flexible scopes. The resolution is not quite as good. And we also have multi-angled scopes so we can look around in different directions. Um, although I tend not to use these that often. Um, this just shows you an example of doing a surgery with a standard uh, lens where we're kind of going in and, and we can see a certain amount, probably a 30 degree lens. So we do get some angled view. And then this video, see if I can start it. We'll show you the view you can get with this 90 degree lens where we can go into this cavity and then actually turn a dial and look straight up. I'll show you that in a second. There we go. So we're turning this dial and, and looking 90 degrees. And then, so, you know, you can always have different degrees of view that allow you to see things that you otherwise couldn't see deep into cavities. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.